if you go into a Catholic church, you'll very likely see a statue like this right here. It's our Lord Jesus Christ, but the heart is not on the inside. The heart is on the outside. Now, I wasn't raised a Catholic. I'm a Catholic now. And I got to admit, this is one of the peculiar devotions that people on the outside of Catholicism looking in see. Other ones would be, for example, Infant of Prague, Marian devotions, etc. But this one, especially, is one that people object to or find strange. Um, Protestant evangelicals and Eastern Orthodox um, raise questions and feel uncomfortable about the sacred heart devotion. So today, I'm going to do a little bit of history and a little bit of theology, even going back to the Crusades. It might be a connection that you've never made. You probably always think sacred heart of Jesus goes back to St. Margaret Mary, but actually it's a religious phenomenon. It's a devotion that comes out of the environment of the crusade. So I'm going to go over that uh, today. I'm going to go over some scripture and then just look at some of the emergence of sacred heart devotion, especially in the 1200s after the crusades. So again, you're looking at this picture and I would say, you know, if you're an evangelical Protestant, you're not a Catholic, uh, maybe Eastern Orthodox, you know, we often talk about give your heart to Jesus. It's sort of a pietistic understanding of conversion to Christ. Take your heart and give it to Jesus. And what you see in the mystics in the sacred heart tradition is actually, it's not a reversal, but it is a complement to it. It's Christ giving his heart to you. And we'll see in one of the mystics, there's actually exchange. You give your heart to Jesus, and Jesus gives his heart to you. Now, this is something that even little kids understand. On Valentine's Day, kids have these Valentines. They always have hearts on them. And you exchange hearts. It's a sign of union. It's a sign of love. It's a sign of devotion. Now, like I said, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque is the mystic who really popularizes the devotion of the Sacred Heart. This happens in the 1600s. Really, the visions and the and the message is 1673 to 1675. But it actually goes back 500 years or so before that with an increased devotion to the humanity of Jesus Christ. And this is because of the Crusades. We often talk about St. Francis of Assisi and how he brings about devotion to the humanity of Christ by creating the creche, the Christmas creche, where you have baby Jesus and Joseph and Our Lady, Mary, and you have angels and animals, right? That's all a devotion to the humanity of Jesus. Why was that happening in the 1200s? The reason is, before that, we had the Crusades. And we had mighty men from Europe going to the Holy Land in experiencing something that they hadn't experienced before in their Christian life. And that is, they came in contact with the Holy Sepulchre. What is the Holy Sepulchre? The Holy Sepulchre is the tomb of Jesus Christ. It has the actual tomb that Christ rose from the dead. And near it, if you've been to the Holy Sepulchre, is Golgotha, the place where Christ died on the cross for our sins. This awakened a devotion to the suffering, to the death of Christ, and to the resurrection of Christ. Christ wasn't just in this new sort of creator, uh, crusader piety. He wasn't just seated at the right hand of the Father. They were now encountering him in the Holy Land, in his human nature, in his suffering, and in his death. They went on the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrows, which they brought back to Europe in the form of the way of the cross, which we do during Lent as Catholics, even to this day. It's a way of entering into the passion of Jesus Christ. They found and went to the sites of the agony in the garden. There was devotion to the pillar where Christ was whipped and scourged. And there is also an increased devotion in the holy wounds, the five holy wounds of Christ. All of this is brought back to Europe. Now, this is not new. If you read the Gospel of John, we we read there that John places his head on the chest, on the heart of Christ at the Last Supper. Also, the Gospel of John makes a very big deal about how Christ's side is opened with a lance. In the Catholic tradition, 
the centurion who did that is a saint, Saint Longinus. And we also have in John's gospel where Thomas, doubting Thomas, says, I'm not going to believe. I don't believe he rose from the dead unless I put my hands in the side. And Christ appears to Thomas and says, do it. Reach into my side. Literally, it's, it's saying, touch my heart. And what does Thomas say? My Lord and my God. He believes. So devotion to the wounds of Christ, in particular, devotion to the side wound of Christ, becomes a new way of encountering Christ for the Crusaders. Even in the Latin Mass, during Paschal Tide, during Easter, we chant in the Mass, at the very beginning of the Mass, from the Old Testament, I saw water, vidiaquam, I saw water coming forth from the temple on the right side, alleluia, and all those to whom this water came were saved and shall say alleluia. St. John, the apostle, tells us that when they pierced the side of Christ, blood and water came forth. And that's the idea here with devotion to the sacred heart. Now, there's something more. In Latin, the word for heart is core, C O R, core. It's where we get the English word core, C O R E. For example, we talk about the core of planet Earth, it's the middle. We talk about the core of an apple. Now, in English, we talk, people talk about they want to work out their core. They usually mean their abs. That's actually not right. Your core is your heart. In Latin, core is the heart. It's the core of the person. We talk about core values. The core values of Jesus Christ in his sacred heart is to redeem and save every single human person from Adam and Eve all the way to the end. Now, as Christians, we believe that the second person of the Trinity, the Logos, the divine person, assumed a human nature. And that includes a body, a soul, and a will. These are all the, ecumen the first six ecum ecumenical councils. And the divinity and the humanity of Christ are not mixed, not absorbed, but rather, as we learn in the Council of Chalcedon, the two natures are united in the hypostatic union. This means that we worship the whole Christ. We don't just worship a part of him. We don't just worship the heart, for example, or the head or the face. We worship the whole Christ. Now, in particular, the popes of recent years, uh, Saint Leo the, uh, Pope Leo XIII, uh, Pius XI, Pius uh, X, Pius XII, they talk about devotion to the Sacred Heart as especially fitting, it's worship of the whole Christ, but worship of the Sacred Heart is especially fitting. Why? It's the core. It's the center. It's where John the Apostle laid his head. It's where his side was opened up. It's where the blood and water come from. But in a Jewish understanding, the heart is where the center of the person is. And if you go back and read Leviticus, there are special kosher laws, precise ways on how to kill a sacrifice, how to kill an animal, with the most important feature being keeping the heart alive to pump all the blood out of the animal. In Jewish law, you're not allowed to eat meat with the blood in it. So in kosher laws in Leviticus, there's a way to kill the animal so that the blood, the, the heart keeps pumping and pushes all the blood out. And that is exactly what Christ our Lord, the Lamb of God, the Messiah, did for us on the cross. So the heart of Christ is the body of Christ, but the heart of Christ is the nexus between the body and the blood. And that's what the Eucharist is. The Eucharist is the body and the blood. And so the heart is that connection of the body and the blood together. And when he dies for us, when he offers himself, it's the heart that pushes the blood forward so that he is the Passover sacrifice for us. We find this, by the way, taught by St. Peter, the first pope. First Peter I think it's chapter 1, verse 18, right here. Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as gold or silver from your vain conversation of the, of the tradition of your fathers, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, 
as a lamb unspotted and undefiled. You and me, if we are in Christ, if we believe, if we hope, if we love Christ, if we are baptized and covered with his blood, we are redeemed. We are purchased, not with gold and silver, not with Bitcoin or dollars or pounds or euros, with the blood of Christ. And this understanding of the humanity of Christ, the blood of Christ, the core of Christ, leads to this blossoming, this flourishing of devotion to the Sacred Heart. Now, we see this beginning in St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Of course, St. Bernard of Clairvaux was, in a way, the monastic inspiration for the Templars and the Crusaders. The Templars were, in a way, Cistercian monks. They wore the white like a Cistercian, but they were to protect and to fight for Christendom. Again, this is 500 years before we see Mar St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. In the 1200s, in the wake of the Crusades, we find this spread all throughout Europe in all the religious orders, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, uh, the Carthusians, the Norbertines, Benedictines, everyone. Uh, one of the first ones we see is from a Norbertine. This is Blessed Herman Joseph, and he is said to write the earliest hymn in honor of the Sacred Heart. And the hymn begins with these words translated in English, I hail thee, kingly heart most high. Now, this is one of the things you'll see in Sacred Heart imagery. Um, if you see statues or paintings, you'll see that Christ with his Sacred Heart exposed is often depicted as a king. And again, this goes back to this crusader idea that they are carrying the cross of Christ and they are serving him, not for the king of France, the king of the Holy Roman Emperor, king of England. Their true king is in heaven. So the hymn begins, I hail thee, kingly heart most high. And that really captures the sacred heart devotion right there. As we see as the centuries roll on, sacred heart devotion becomes a symbol of the reign of Jesus Christ over secular society, secular kingdoms, and still is right now. Another example is St. Lutgard. She's a Cistercian. She is also in the, she dies in the 1240s. And she has a vision of the pierced heart of the Savior. And she's, she asks Christ for a favor. And it's interesting what she asks for. She asks that she might have a better grasp of Latin so that she can study the scriptures and better perform her singing of the Psalms and the choral offices to Christ. It's a very, I think, sweet request of a nun in the 1200s, a better grasp of Latin. And Christ gives her this request, and she has sort of an infused knowledge of Latin. But then she says, I want another favor. I want something else. And Christ asks, Lord, or she says, um, her heart. She'll give her heart. And so Christ makes the deal with her and he reaches into her heart or her chest and takes her heart and takes his heart and makes a switch, just like on Valentine's Day. So here again, this is this idea of the heart of Jesus being shared. Yes, we give our heart to Jesus, but in a way he gives us our heart. Can we really love God and love our neighbor with our broken and sinful heart? Not so much. So what Christ does is he says, I'm going to give you my heart so you can love the unlovely. I'm going to give you my heart so you can battle against sin and love God. Another great saint, St. Saint Bonaventure, great scholastic theologian of the Franciscan order, he said, and he died in the 1270s, he said, who is there who would not love this wounded heart? Who would not love and return him who loves him so much? Again, you can see the theme here of love. And that's kind of wrapped into this post-crusade new devotion to the humanity of Christ is seeing how much Christ loved us in the Passion and on the cross. Just one more saint, St. Matilda. She is reported to that Jesus appeared to her in a vision and commanded her to love him ardently. 
and to honor his sacred heart and the blessed sacrament as much as possible. He gave her his heart as a pledge of his love to her and as a place of refuge during her life and as her consolation in the hour of death. And from this time, Matilda had an extraordinary devotion to the sacred heart and is said, it is said that if she had to write down all the favors and all the blessings which she had received by means of this devotion, a large book would not contain them. So that's four saints in the 1200s in the wake of the Crusades as these priests, as these men are returning from the Holy Land and bringing this renewed devotion to the humanity of Jesus and for his love for mankind. Eventually, over the many centuries, again, I mentioned St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. You've probably seen this image. I believe that's St. Margaret Mary Alacoque of Christ revealing so much. I'm going to do an, a second video to this one on the promises. Christ gives 12 promises to devote for devotion to his sacred heart. I'll do that in a part two. Um, but what we see here is eventually with the establishment of the feast, and then popes begin consecrating humanity, all humans on earth, to the heart of Jesus. And it's interesting, too, to see this sort of unfold after the Protestant Reformation, after the 1500s, because you have Luther teaching the heresy of justification by faith alone. We know from James chapter 2, we're justified by faith and works, not by faith alone. But there's also the part in Galatians that we are justified by faith working through love. And St. Paul says, you know, you can... You can raise the dead, you can prophesy, you can speak in tongues. He, he lists all these miraculous things. But if you don't have love, you're just a clinging gong. You're nothing. And so I think after the Reformation, and in particular in France, where you have the Jansenist her heresy, which is really just Catholicism and a Protestant rap, emphasis on the love of Jesus for us and our reciprocal love for Jesus. A promise, I'll end with this, the promise of our Lord to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque in the context of the Sacred Heart Devotion. He says, In the excess of the mercy of my heart, I promise you that my powerful love will grant all those who will receive communion on the first Fridays for nine consecutive months the grace of final repentance. They will not die in my displeasure, nor without receiving the sacraments, and my heart will be their secure refuge in the last hour. So in the next video, I'm going to talk a little bit about, or a lot about, the promises of devotion to the Sacred Heart. If you struggle with, does God love me? If you struggle with loving your neighbor, loving people who have wounded you, the Sacred Heart devotion is one that, it gets to the heart of it. It's about love. It's about Him loving you, pumping out all of his blood to redeem you and every single sinner. And then we say, take my heart, Lord. Hey, thanks for watching. Uh, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please like it and please share it on Facebook or Twitter. And if you're new, please do subscribe and hit the subscribe button. You can also push that in the bottom right corner. And when you do hit the little dinghy bell and that will notify you whenever I do a new video or go live. Also, if you're new to my channel, you know I always say, please read the Bible every single day. Read it as a family. Get to know the Word of God. Change and renew your mind by God's Word. And also, you need to pray every day. And a great way to begin praying is to sit down with the beads and pray the rosary every single day. Five decades, five mysteries every day. Pray the rosary every day find a solid Catholic church. I always recommend the traditional Latin mass. Get to confession every one to four weeks. Get serious and get close to Christ. And remember, our Lord Jesus Christ says, you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless, Godspeed, and Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us.